Before we get to the main attraction, I have to provide a recap for Soul Eater. This is somewhat mandatory, as I want to introduce people to the series and jog some people's memory if they've seen it in the past. Soul Eater is a manga series both written and illustrated by Atsushi Okubo that ran from 2005 to 2013. The manga received an anime adaptation by Studio Bones in 2008 that ran until 2009, spanning 51 episodes. It is relatively popular in the anime community and was positively received overall. Our story is set in America in a place called Death City, a place that the Death Weapon Meister Academy, or DWMA for short, resides in. The school is run by Death himself as a means of getting rid of demons called Kishin and preventing more from being made. Kishin come from eggs that are formed by the corrupted souls of people, and if strong enough can hatch and mutate them into Kishin who go around wreaking havoc and killing people. Not only does the DWMA handle Kishin, but they also deal with witches, as they can stir up trouble. The DWMA can't do this all without students, as people in this world are capable of turning into weapons and need a Meister or partner to use them. It is important to note that not all weapons and Meisters are compatible and must develop a relationship with each other in order to work together, as their souls should be linked and be on the same wavelength. As an incentive for students to attend the Academy, they must collect 100 Kishin souls and one Witch soul in order to become a Death Scythe, a weapon used by Death. This can be equated to graduating in a sense, as it is the end goal for most students, as they are sent on missions to collect enough souls in order to reach peak status as a Death Scythe. Our main cast consists of Maka Albarn and her scythe Soul Evans, Blackstar and his transforming blade, Tsubaki, as well as Death the Kid, the son of Death and his two guns, Wiz and Patty. These characters are given a lot of screen time and are seen with each other a lot, leading to them developing and growing at the same pace as they go through ups, downs, and sometimes wacky situations. Not only are the main cast developed, but the supporting cast and villains are too. Every new character introduced is bound to get some attention and grow on you, as they are all great. Personally speaking, seeing the characters form bonds and develop them in order to get stronger is the best aspect of the series, as the characters genuinely have good chemistry and bounce off each other very well. Some of the most gripping episodes have to be the ones that touch upon the concept of compatibility and dynamics regarding it, as things can get really tense depending on the power dynamic and balance between a weapon and Meister. I want to get into something that made the show stand out at a glance regardless of if you've seen it or not. First, the art style. The art style is very unique and has an imperfect feel to it that's charming. Its aesthetic is also a standout feature, as it is Halloween themed with a lot of spooky architecture and interesting character designs. When I say the art style is imperfect, I mean that the style isn't very sleek. It's rough around the edges with rough line work and oddities that work in its favor. I should probably mention that the anime style is very different from the manga, as when it started, there wasn't a lot to go off of. A lot of characters look childlike and pudgy. Overall, the art wasn't very consistent at the time, so Studio Bones worked with what they had and kept the spirit of everything there with their adaptation and refinement of the characters. Of course, the style of the manga developed over the years and got better, but it was a good foundation for the anime considering that it was three years into its run at the time of production. The second thing that makes it stand out is the fights. The fights are very fluid and weighty. They don't feel like typical fights in anime, as you see strategies play out and even get countered on top of dynamics of meisters and weapons impacting the direction they take. The choreography and shot compositions are quick and snappy as well as strong, as you never lose track of the characters or have difficulty seeing what's going on. One minute you can see someone using a weapon and the next they could be flipping around and using their fists. It has stellar animation to boot, something to be expected from Studio Bones. With all things visual covered, let's proceed on to the audio. Composed by Taku Ibosaki, the soundtrack is phenomenal with every track fitting the series like a glove. It's both atmospheric and exhilarating when it needs to be, and really makes things more impactful. Not only are there instrumental tracks, but vocal tracks from artists like Lotus Juice, who was known for doing music for the Persona series. The soundtrack has variety with a list of over 40 songs in total. Each and every track is memorable and can be associated with almost every scene that they play in from memory, even if someone can't remember the name of the song itself. Staying within the realm of audio, let's move on to the voice acting. The voice acting is spot on and nearly perfect, with every character sounding genuine. Nothing ever feels off, and is very natural sounding. There's never an awkward line reading from any of the actors, and I feel it's due to both the scripting and talent of the actors themselves. I don't have a lot of time, so I won't be able to cover a lot of them, but the most memorable ones for me have to be Laura Bailey voicing Maka, Mike Solisad voicing Soul, and Brittany Karbowski as Blackstar. Now that I've given you all the great things about the show, I'll talk a bit about the adaptation of the source material. Due to the anime running while the manga was incomplete at the time, there is an original ending that happens. Some hate it and some love it. I know some manga readers dislike the series solely because of the ending itself. This isn't the only original thing that the anime has done, as it has actually filled in some gaps that the manga left behind and added a bit more depth to some plot points as well as reinterpreting and changing the sequencing of others. 
Key items with future uses in the manga had been given completely different functions that border on the lines of beneficial and detrimental, as some instances have forced them to alter other plot elements as a result of it. Due to this being an ongoing adaptation of an ongoing manga, it is expected that some unpredictable things could crop up and shake the foundation a bit. Overall, it just depends on what you're looking for and how faithful of an adaptation you want. This could be considered both good and bad, so it's a bit of a gray area. In conclusion, Soul Eater is an exciting series filled to the brim with many memorable, funny, and intense moments. It is an action-packed joyride that is definitely worth watching if you have the time, regardless of how you split it. You can easily binge the series in two days, and if you're fine with watching it weekly, that's an option too, since it's streamable on Netflix and Funimation. The series is also available on Blu-ray and DVD, so there's an abundance of access points. If I were to put the series on a scale, it'd get 9s all across the board and a 9 as a complete package, with the only thing holding it back from a 10 being the ending. I highly recommend this to casual viewers and anime fans who haven't had the chance to see it. You won't regret it. With this series covered, I'm now going to ease into what you've all been waiting for, Soul Eater Not. Greg and I watched High School of the Dead on May 23rd, and from there we had already planned out what we'd watch the next weekend. Unfortunately, a swarm of bees kept me out of my room, so we had to skip a weekend. for sure that we'd watch something the week after that. And what it happened to be was Soul Eater Not. On June 7th, 2020, at 4.44 p.m., we geared up to binge the series with snacks on hand and ample time on our hands. I'd seen episodes 1 through 6 prior to this in 2014, but didn't remember a lot other than how the anime community perceived it and the sour reactions to it, referring to the series as Not Soul Eater. Despite my past knowledge, Greg and I dove into the series with somewhat low expectations, since I told him about it beforehand. Soul Eater Not is a... <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Let me fact check this actually. Um, Soul Eater Not Manga. There we go. Yep, November 10th, 2014. All right, just make sure, just make sure. All right, all right. Soul Leader Not is a spin-off manga that ran from 2011 to 2014, both written and illustrated by Asushi Okubo, the same author and illustrator of the main series. The manga received an anime adaptation in 2014 by Studio Bones, the same studio that animated the original anime. The series is substantially shorter than the original, only spanning 12 episodes. The story takes place before the events of the original Soul Leader manga and is a slice of life series as opposed to its action-heavy counterpart. The story stars our main character, Sugumi Haradori, a Japanese girl who discovers that she has the ability to transform into a weapon. Through this discovery, she is prone promptly sent to the DWMA and put into the lower class, normally overcome target or not for short. This is not the same class that we saw in the original, which is referred to as EAT or especially advantage talent class. One of the most defining traits of the not class is that their students aren't quite there yet in terms of experience nor control of their powers, something that Tsugumi really struggles with, as she hasn't even found a meister yet. Due to their lack of control and experience, not students aren't sent on missions. At this point, we are introduced to the second member of our main cast, Anya Hepburn. She is a high-strung princess with combat training who takes a liking to Tsugumi almost instantly, as she analyzes everything about her from her demeanor all the way down to her figure. An authentic commoner! Weapon her hairstyle is unassuming. Weapon. She has no figure to speak of, and despite her utter lack of poise or charisma, she has a sweetly unconcerned please. blank smile. From that point on, Anya is dead set on being Sugumi's meister, so she tries to talk to her. This is where our third member, Meimei Tatame, shows up abruptly. One thing that immediately sticks out about her is her forgetfulness, as she's already forgotten her name when they all introduce themselves. As for me, let me think. Um... I thought I knew it, but I guess I forgot. <laughs> as soon as all the class are in the room, Maka and Sol are brought in to demonstrate what the class will be capable of when they find a Meister and get used to transforming. This prompts Sugumi to look up to Maka and aim to be like her. After class ends, Meimei and Sugumi head out into the hall where there are two boys standing by the door. They begin to hit on Meimei and attempt to make her their Meister. This makes her uncomfortable, as Sugumi, who is treated almost as if she doesn't exist, stands up for her new friend. This results in her being met with degrading comments on her appearance and even threats of violence, which causes Anya to come into the picture and take the two boys on her own in hand-to-hand -hand combat. This causes their teacher, Sid, to encourage Sugumi to turn into a weapon, a blunt-edged halberd. 
When Tsugumi is transformed, Anya uses her to make quick work of the two attackers as Meimei watches. After this brief scuffle, both Anya and Meimei express their want to be Tsugumi's meister. After the first episode, this premise is expanded upon with how the dorm life of the DWMA works, and following our main cast as they learn more about each other along the way during this development time in their lives. Episode 2 introduces one of the supporting cast members of the original series, Kim Deal, who was referred to as the Witch of the Dorms. She ended up helping out our main cast on their first night in the dorms, as it got pretty hectic when the housemaster Misery attempted to reconstruct Sugumi's space with a mallet. Due to this, she requested a fee from Sugumi, ending in her being broke, as well as her partners for different reasons. Anya went on a shopping spree and ended up selling her family brooch, while Meimei had simply forgotten where she put her allowance. Excuse me, an order of noodles, please. You mean three orders, right? No thanks, just the one. This sudden lack of money pushes Sugumi, Anya, and Meimei to get a job at a cafe named Death Bucks. This is where we are introduced to two supporting characters who were also in the Not class, Akane and Clay. They serve to support Sugumi and the rest of the main cast along the way. After their hard day of work, Sugumi ends up getting Anya a DWMA brooch as a replacement for the one that was sold off. The story starts to get slightly serious with the second fight in the series taking place in Episode 3, as something strange happens in Death City. People referred to as traitors are starting to attack and even kill civilians, with one of them managing to back Anya into a corner with her only way out being Sugumi and Meimei who rush to the scene and fight the person off. This is the first time Meimei has been shown using Sugumi in combat, and it was surprising to me that she was fairly competent at wielding her. This tonal shift was something that Greg and I had anticipated, but then it went back to the status quo of being a light-hearted slice of life. Episode 6 introduces two supporting cast members from the original series, Liz and Patty, who've had a hard life in Brooklyn and work at Death Bucks while on probation. They aren't very kind to customers and end up getting into a scuffle with Sugumi and Anya, resulting in everyone but Sugumi avoiding the place. The next day, she stumbles upon Death the Kid, their meister, and eventually confronts them with Meimei and Anya to make them understand that nobody is out to harm them in Death City and that they can put their guard down. This shapes how they will be in the future and fleshes them out, something that this series does well when using old characters. Towards the end of the episode, we get another look into what's going on behind the scenes, and it turns out that Sid, Akane, and Clay have interrogated one of the traitors and find that one of their guards has killed their suspect. This is yet another tonal shift towards a serious matter that veers its head from episode 7 onto the rest of the series. This leads to the first issue that I have with the series. Things started to get dicey around episode 8, as the series introduced a formula. Sugumi, Anya, and Meimei set a deadline of Halloween for a meister to be chosen. It ditches the overall series tone that episode 7 set previously, and opted for a pattern that became maddening. While this decision has the intent of developing the main cast, it is disproportionate to the main story, and ends up sidetracking it more than anything. The original series hasn't had any issues with this, as the first four episodes introduce the main cast and development comes in future episodes that focus directly on them, in tandem with the main story. If you've already noticed that I skipped about two episodes, when going over my designated four, it's due to nothing significant happening when it comes to the story. Episode 4 develops Sugumi the most, and Episode 5 fleshes out Kim, while giving no background info on the main villain, making it seem like the conflict has been completely dropped only for it to spring back up in Episode 6. As for the series when it isn't being serious, it started out decent and fairly funny, but Meimei was the brunt of all jokes, which got old after Episode 4, as she got into fights while sleepwalking or switched beds in almost every episode. The most egregious instance of this joke is Episode 9 in its entirety. The episode focuses on Meimei for roughly 16 minutes, as she wakes up with a bag of money, a sloth, and a missing eyebrow. She she takes a stroll through Death City, and is met with a man chasing her, seeking to get his belongings back. She runs from him and ends up giving the sloth back to its owner, a kid. She then stumbles across a casino, which is revealed that she gambled at. She remembered none of the stuff that she did, and that was the worst that we'd seen her do at this point. The way this is all presented makes her seem like the bad guy and that there could be negative repercussions to her actions, but it only ended up getting played off as a joke halfway through the episode, which caused me extreme whiplash, as I felt that the show actively wasted my time and misled me when I was possibly the most engaged with the character. Her faulty memory and sleepwalking became the punchline of a poorly paced gag and not a one-off moment that lasted about 10 seconds. This moment had me suddenly frustrated and ready to quit to the point of begging to see something good. Greg was the only thing that kept me going, as we wanted to finish what we started despite how boring it got for him, and how repetitive and disappointing it got for me. Mei Mei's flaws were a very serious matter in episode 10, as everything came crashing down so late in the game. I had a feeling that if episode 9 hadn't happened or ended with how episode 10 started, it would have achieved what it set out to do instead of leaving bitterness at its conclusion. It was at this point that Greg began to drift off into other discussions and topics as things happened right in front of our eyes. I was unsure if he was paying attention anymore, as I was throughout the whole thing. The end of episode 10 had me pumped, as everything began to pick up and the tone stayed consistent as the tension started rising. We had been hit with a plot twist that completed Meimei's character arc and started Anya's arc as well. At that point, they were done playing games and everything became 
what I had imagined the series being from episode 6 onward. Suddenly during episode 11, my mom came home and wanted me to cook something. So I told Greg to continue watching and I'd be in the kitchen watching it on my phone. When I got back, Greg was passed out and I was left alone to determine what the show really was in my eyes. I had been taken on this ride full of potential and disappointment for over three hours, and I was finally getting what I wanted, the plot to get rolling. I was completely gripped in it and couldn't wait to see the climax. I was captivated by how the series had evolved within just three episodes, and I messaged Greg immediately telling him that the ending made it all worth it. I didn't care if he was asleep, I just felt like telling him so we could possibly finish it together when he got back up. Before I went to sleep, I felt the urge to read the manga, as I felt it would be different ever since we started watching. It turned out that nothing was really different when I finished it, and I went on to do some research on the series. I discovered a total bombshell of a reason for its existence, and the history of it. The creator wanted to flesh out the world that he'd made and had no other way to do it than to create a spin-off, as Soul Leader was in the middle of its run and about to reach its end. He didn't want to take time away from the main story by giving heavy exposition or any other method that would interrupt the story being told, so he wanted to get out of his comfort zone and make something of a different genre. Something safe to expose the smaller details of Death City and like how people live and things of that nature. In hindsight, this is a great idea, considering that Soul Leader didn't have a real start, as it began as a series of one-shots that didn't get serialized until we noticed the potential that it had. This wasn't just a cash-in or continuation like much of the fanbase and anime community considered it to be at the time. It is something that is undeserving of its status as a cursed property, or something that had no reason to exist. It definitely has its issues, such as its strange place in the continuity of the anime and manga, as it shatters it on both fronts. For an idea of how odd this is, Akane and Clay show up in some of the final chapters of the Soul Leader manga, thus breaking the sequencing of things as well as contradicting certain plot points, such as Blackstar being the last member of his clan, and even tidbits of information on one of the villains. It was connected to the original manga, but its place in the anime isn't feasible due to the original ending that it had. While it wasn't received positively among the anime community nor myself initially, I can at least respect the effort that was made to build upon the setting of a story that ran for nine years. This doesn't make it devoid of any criticism, but it has really shown me that there's more than what meets the eye when it comes to these things, quality aside. Speaking of quality, let's move on to the other aspects of the series. As a Studio Bones anime, it is typically expected to have amazing fight scenes and good animation all around, but this series really sticks out like a sore thumb in terms of animation. It doesn't compare to the original series in any way, even through the art style. While Soul Eater Not looks a lot closer to the manga compared to the original anime, it leaves a lot to be desired. As many people who haven't read the manga can note that most of the old cast looks off. Not only does the old cast look off, but the fights do as well. Greg and I watched the series dubbed, which means they had corrected footage to work with. This means that the fights are awkwardly done with animation errors to the root that are noticeable. I have my doubts that the TV airing of the show looked any better, but comparisons between the Blu-ray and broadcast versions have little to no changes. Not only does this low animation quality carry over to the fights, but the show as a whole can have odd moments where characters are drawn off model, and the frames are held for just long enough for you to see clear as day. Most of the time the animation is very limited and reeks of either low budgeting or time constraints of some sort, though a lot of limited animation is on model. Being on model can't save it from the modern climate of anime, as it looks more generic in terms of line work, colors, and backgrounds this time around due to it leaning more on the digitally vibrant and smooth side. Overall, the series looks like it'd be welcome in a studio like A1 Pictures Library, not Studio Bones given how inconsistent it is. The music is done by two composers, Asami Tachibana and Yuki Hayashi. Unfortunately, I couldn't hear a lot of the music tracks, and when I did, they weren't very memorable outside of one that played in the first fight of episode 1. I think it's best to listen to the music externally, as you'll barely notice the tracks playing in the background. I was genuinely surprised at how many songs there were in the soundtrack, as they were decent too. It's nothing on the caliber of the original, but I feel it suits the show very well. The voice acting is one of the best things about this series. All of the voices fit the characters well, especially the main cast, and it seems that they enjoy dubbing and experiencing the series overall. Sugami is voiced by Bryn April, who delivers lines crisply and nails her personality in quirks. Alexis Tipton voices Anya in a way that shows how snobby she can get at times while not overwhelming the viewer. Lindsay Saito captures Mei Mei's energetic demeanor greatly and doesn't get grating. Overall, the voice acting is great and never fails to be believable. Solely or not is something that does its job and doesn't go beyond that. It is definitely an anomaly, as everything that it does builds up to a satisfying conclusion that makes up for almost all of its shortcomings and glaring issues. In all honesty, this is something I wouldn't recommend to someone unless they weren't into Soul Eater or just want to see the light at the end of the tunnel. This series is very divisive and shouldn't be looked at as more Soul Eater, because it really isn't. There's a lot of irony in the statement, Soul Eater Not is not Soul Eater. It is a double entendre, as it has two interpretations, one good and the other being bad. Greg gave the series a 6 or 7 out of 10, but if I were to rate it on all aspects, I'd give the story a 5, animation a 4, music a 4, and voice acting a 9. 
This review was definitely a hard one, as I have mixed feelings about this series. Hopefully this wasn't too hard to understand, as it was difficult to condense an entire series worth of lore and story into a few minutes. I guess starting reviews and watching this show was the gateway to a nostalgia trip back to 2012 when I saw the original as it aired on TV every week. I guess I found a reason to appreciate Soul Eater Not. That's gonna be it. Thanks for coming. If you like this video, give it a like. If you really like it, share it around. Talk to people about it. Also, if you want to support the channel, I have a Patreon that you can donate to. I also have a Discord server that you can join and a Twitter that you can follow. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.